Okay, so the purpose of this video is to try and take some of the potentially quite dense concepts highlighted in the definition of terms videos, video and unpack that a bit and try and make it a little bit more accessible. And as time goes by, I increasingly realise that if there is any value to the work that I try to do here, it is really to try and articulate or distill some potentially quite sophisticated complex information into the most accessible, digestible form possible. People might be familiar with the term Occam's razor, for instance, which may be not entirely appropriate, but I think where we're out of step with the reality of complex biological systems at the moment is the product of some rather limited, of a limited erroneous reductionist scientific model. It leads us to making some very simple and naive assumptions and conclusions about complex biological processes which are just infinitely more complex than our rather simplistic understanding leads us to believe. And I'm always very keen on quotes, uh, quotes that actually take complex things and, and manage to convey it in a very kind of direct way. And for the last 20 plus years or so, the guiding uh, star, as it were, in, in much of my work has been this Buckminster Fuller quote, which I think you see a, a lot of these days, which explains my sort of theory of change. You cannot create change by fighting the existing reality. You have to make a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. In the last year or two, this quote from H.L. Macon, who I think was a sort of American satirist essayist, uh, has become increasingly pertinent, and I now just uh, feel compelled to make a short video which unpacks that a bit and applies it to our understanding of, of topsoil regeneration uh, and the way we, we deal with food and farming, the microbiome and the way we deal with complex and systemic chronic illness, and the way we're looking at these uh, uh, biospheric uh, issues like climate change. So this is a sort of micro to macro journey, but trying to illustrate the fact that the core thinking I'm trying to articulate here applies at all levels of the system. So let's start with topsoil, which funny enough I think is the one that's easiest for people to understand, uh, easier in a funny kind of way than, than trying to understand the, the inner workings of our own bodies. But if we apply this thinking to that, I hope it will make some sense. So, for instance, here's the topsoil. And when I wrote Rising Tides, my book 20 years ago, our understanding about soil biology was very limited. We still thought it took thousands and thousands of years to build topsoil. But recent advances with electron microscopy and all of this have enabled us to see that, you know, this is a much more complex process than we thought. But also that the ability to use topsoil and our farming systems to draw carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and back into the earth can happen much, much more quickly than we thought. And it has these systemic positive consequences, not just in terms of rebuilding the health of the soil and the health of the food system, but also the health of our microbiomes and the rest of it. So what we now understand about uh, the complexities of living, thriving, organic topsoil is that one teaspoon, some people say even one gram, of this soil contains more living organisms than every human being that ever lived. An overwhelming statistic, but incredibly important to bear in mind. So you have, say we've got this as a bit of grassland, and this grass, as it grows through photosynthesis, draws carbon out of the atmosphere, through the plant, down through the root, roots and into the soil. And here you have an incredibly complex mixture of mycelium, of the uh, fungal networks, what's called hyphae, these little sort of roots on the, the, the hairs on the roots of the plants, and gazillions of biota, of little microorganisms. So here there's this unbelievably complex metabolic system that maintains the nutrient levels of the soil, shares the nutrients uh, between the, the, the different organisms, etc, etc. Along comes a grazing animal and it eats the grass digest the grass, and out comes very important uh, poo, nutrients, that go back to the soil and keep this process in a circular fashion. Now, when it does that, of course, the grass gets nibbled down, but that encourages more growth. That encourages this grass to draw more carbon out of the atmosphere. So the more that this process is happening at a natural uh, rate, the faster we're drawing carbon 
out of the atmosphere and back into the soil. Now, what happens when you take this complex system and you apply an industrial farming system to it? First of all, you come along and you plow this all up. So it destroys all of this soil structure. It destroys the ability for the soil to actually uh, share and, and the nutrients efficiently. It destroys the ability of the soil to actually uh, harbor, uh, harness uh, rainwater and moisture because uh, it, it runs off. It exposes it to wind and sun and rain. And essentially, you've catalyzed an entropic process, i.e. Its, its, its tendency is now, rather than being a cyclical regenerative one, it started to become a degenerative one. <clears throat> and then because of the way our economics is structured, you think that the most efficient way to actually deal with this plough field is to plant one crop across the whole lot. Now, because you've planted a monoculture, because you've planted one crop, the ability of that ecosystem to withstand external changes is much reduced. Its resilience and its immunity and its ability to deal with an external pest is immediately reduced. This is why the potato famine happened in Ireland in the mid-19th century, because they only planted one type of potato, etc. So, as a consequence, you resort to agrochemicals to deal with the aphid or whatever it is that come, has come along and started to destroy your crop. And so you spray the whole of the field with a, a synthetic pesticide, herbicide, fungicide combination of all of them, which is sequestered into the crop itself, into uh, the roots, and then down into the soil. Now, yes, you kill the aphid or the whatever it is that you want to kill, but you've killed everything else. Uh, at the same time, you realize over successive years that the soil fertility is on the way down, so you keep adding ever compounding amounts of chemical fertilizer to maintain that level of fertility. But the 84 trace minerals that were in here, which are integral to our diet, is too complex to deal with. So you end up just adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, uh, to the soil with this naive assumption that, well, that's all that it really needs. Now, of course, they're synthetic, they're not really bioavailable, and they don't really do the job that you think that they're doing. They lead to lots of excessive runoff. They pollute water sources and destroy aquatic ecosystems downstream. So you're, again, immediately into a degenerative and depleting process, where as time goes by, you need ever greater applications of non of these synthetic chemicals to try and keep the system going. And all that's happening is you're killing and destroying the topsoil. And you're ensuring, like we have now, the ability to, you know, the, you know, effectively, the end of civilization because you've destroyed its agricultural base. Now, if we apply the same thinking to the microbiome and the similar kind of uh, insights that have revealed the, the complexities of living topsoil have also revealed the complexities of the microbiome. So we now realize that inside. My drawing's not very good, of course, but here's a stomach and intestine, 32 meters of intestine uh, that's the size of a tennis court when you open it up. And it's got one and a half kilos plus of microorganisms in there. Again, yeah, an equivalent number of microorganisms as the neural connections in the brain, sort of 90 billion plus or something like that. I mean, figures that are just beyond our human ability to really conceive of. Now, that complexity of that gut flora is what is responsible for 80-90% of your immune system health. It's also responsible for your mental health because the serotonin and dopamine, the, the, the neuromodulators, these chemicals that really kind of modulate our emotional mood, most of that is produced in the gut. And actually, a lot of that comes originally from the soil. Dopamine and serotonin are produced in healthy topsoil. So when it's removed from the food system at source, uh, its ability to, to be generated in the gut is further compromised too. So as soon as you introduce a non-biological agent to that system, and let's remember, you know, antibiotic, the etymology of that is antibiotics, it's anti-life. Now, I'm not ever dismissing the appropriate use of antibiotics. It was obviously saved many, many lives. It's the over-reliance and over-prescription of antibiotics uh, that has led to the problem we currently in. And I also just want to highlight, as ever, that I'm not dismissive of the extraordinary miraculous breakthroughs in modern 
medical science around treating acute problems that need intervention. What I am saying is that when dealing with complex and systemic chronic problems, this simplistic application of one non-biological agent can only ever catalyze the same process that's going on here. It can only ever be entropic and degenerative. Because the complexity of what's going on in there simply cannot be rebuilt or recreated as soon as it's disturbed by a chemical agent. Whereas if you actually use biological means, bioavailable means through diet and through biological medicine to recreate what, what is ever going on in there, you are inevitably in step with a cyclical and regenerative process. And so you've just got two different trajectories going on here. One is cyclical and regenerative, and one is linear and degenerative. Now, likewise, we, when we apply this at the most macro scale of all to the biosphere and the climate, what I'm suggesting is that if we actually wanted to recorrect the carbon cycle, if we used photosynthetic methods like seaweed farming and intelligent, enlightened agriculture techniques to draw the excess carbon back into the uh, it, it's the uh, it, it's living seaweed or into the soil and out of the atmosphere, we are again moving back into step with the cyclical regenerative process. However, if we think that so in the atmosphere with sulfur dioxide particles or nanoparticles of mirror to try and reflect sunlight into space, this again is just a linear, downstream, simplistic solution to a complex problem and is only ever going to create downstream unintended unforeseen consequences. So I just hope that that in a way helps to really show or articulate in the most simplistic way I can at the moment why the thinking that is propelling so much at the moment is inherently out of step with the way natural biological ecological systems work. And I hope that makes some sense. And I also wanted to preface this by saying that, like everything, there's probably exceptions to every rule. And I'm sure, and no doubt there are exceptions to this, but by and large, and please feedback, tell me where I've got it wrong, ask me more questions. And I totally accept that, uh, that certainty is the product of a closed mind. So I, I, I'm always trying to be open to the fact that that I might be wrong, uh, but it does strike me that this makes a lot more sense than what we're doing at the moment. And I do think that the way we're dealing with this virus at the moment is also completely misaligned with what we ought to be doing. Uh, but that's the topic for another video. Thank you very much.